This week on Writers Inc. I am not a plotter, which I wish I was. I, I really envy people who go, I have it all on little sticky notes and I know where I'm going. I always find myself amazed by my characters. Um, and I do this one thing, which I, I really would recommend for a lot of writers to do. I take my main character out to dinner. And I often do this and I take them out, I go alone and I sit down and I ask them, so what do you think of the story so far? And I think they're going to go, it's great. I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. And often they go, what the hell are you doing? J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's In. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. Patrick O'Donnell. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. So I'm excited. Halloween is over. Beginning of November, eggnog is back in the stores. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the red. Like, I, I, I've got a serious eggnog problem. Like, it got to the point, like, in my 20s where I actually ordered cases of eggnog direct from MacArthur's. Um, and they would ship them to me, like, and, in, in, you know, they were in cans. So, like, you had to use a can opener to open them. Like, that's how they store it, I guess, off season or whatever. But, like, I had eggnog in the house 24 7 for, you know, and basically all year long. Um, I've stopped doing that because I don't want to be 400 pounds. Um, but, yeah, I'm very excited to see it, see it in the store. This is an interesting thing to learn about you. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like some people get really grossed out by eggnog. I, I like it. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is about. I, it, I, I love like eggnog. It. My mother-in-law actually makes a, a homemade eggnog that I look forward to every year, but I would drink even the store-bought stuff, you know, the cartons of it. I'll drink that. Well, unlike you, Kevin, I don't put alcohol in it. I don't I put alcohol yours. in mine, actually. Oh, you don't? Christine no, is the lush. I, uh, not- <laughs> I do. Christine's the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's the lush. She Red cheeks, Christine. Like, cinnamon and nutmeg in it, a little bourbon. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, the only time we do that is when we're, we're heading over to mom's house for, for Christmas. And yeah. we know we're going to be there for like 12 hours of random Christmas family events. Um, yeah. Th- those drinks are spiked heavily, but no, so I that's a Christmas the aid. Eggnog with bourbon. <laughs> yeah. I got my little bourbon chasers for it. That's, that's not awesome. I don't drink them I together. See. That would, that would, uh, that'd be dishonorable to the bourbon. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> You've got right to celebrate this week, right? You got some big news coming out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, and we can finally talk about it. We've kind of skirted this for the past couple of weeks, but uh, yeah, I uh, I was invited to become the CEO of Book Sweeps. So uh, it's been kind of already happened for a while now, but as of yesterday, we sent out the the press release, and it became like an official thing. So. There we are. Sweet. They're big. Is there a ceremony, there. Kevin? Like a coronation <laughs> or something that we should be? <laughs> There's been some ceremonies on my on okay. My side. All right. A uh, little, <laughs> little, little bit of that bourbon we were talking about, but yeah, no, it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. This is a. I, I'm going to confess though, uh, the whole thing kind of scares the crap out of me. So I'm taking it all very seriously, and you know, I'm a, my whole aim is to I want to do something really great for the author community. Uh, and book sweeps is kind of, it's, it's not as known as draft digital by any stretch, but the people who use it have always, uh, really liked it. And I think there's a lot we can do with it to, to really in, help the author community, not just indie authors either. Uh, we, we've, we've actually had accounts with that. We've done some stuff with like Simon and Schuster and some others as well. So it, there's a lot of potential in it. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm excited about it. Scared crapless, yeah, but cool. excited. Congratulations. Thank well, you should you. always do the thing that scares you. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. All Scott. I ever wanted to do was write books. <laughs> it's like our kid stepped out and got his first real job. Yeah. Like, oh, I had to wear pants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, man. All right. Well, I hope it all works out for you. It sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Cool. Well, uh, JP, is, JP is out again. Um, so, Kevin, what is in the news? 
<clears throat> All right. Well, uh, none of this stuff's about me, so I'm not quite as excited about it. Um, <laughs> invite only KDP beta for audiobooks. Amazon has launched an invitation only US beta that enables KDP authors to quickly and easily produce an audiobook version of their ebook using virtual voice narration. Authors will now be able to create an audiobook from an ebook in just a few steps. Authors can sample voices, preview, and customize the audiobook. Audiobooks created through KDP from ebooks in KDP Select will be included in the Audible Plus catalog and eligible for a share of the KDP Select Global Fund. So that does sound like pretty big news, but it won't. There's nothing I can do with it because I'm not in Select. I'm not in KDP Select. I'm in KDP Select. I, I still, I'm kind of, you know, I, I feel AI narration is probably good for nonfiction. It's not quite there, I think, for for fiction books yet. Um, but I'm I'm sure that's coming. I talked to a friend of mine who played with this a little bit, and essentially, you you upload your book, then you can listen to it, then you get you, know, you spend time because you've got to tweak it. You've got to you know throw a comma in here, a semicolon in here, you know, throw this in there, and basically mark it up in order to try and get the voice to enunciate everything in a way that sounds mm. legit. Um, I'm guessing that's all going to you know, continue to improve. I'm sure it, it has to. Um, so, you know, you have to take that into consideration too, like the amount of time you're going to have to put in on the back end to make this sound proper. Like, is it, is it worthwhile uh, versus yeah. the money that you're saving? I'm, I'm guessing for most authors, it probably is. Um, you know, we'll see. I will say this, a Apple and draft digital have a partnership uh, where they're doing this and there's no exclusivity involved um, other than, the book is only going to appear on the Apple platform, the audiobook will, and in libraries. But um, you're not limited. You can't use that file elsewhere, but you're you're not restricted from going out and doing audiobooks elsewhere either. So just throwing it out there because it's a pretty good one. From from a legal standpoint, any idea who owns that that final output file, like that that audio that's AI generated, is that owned by the author or is it owned by Audible? Is it owned by the publisher? You know, I don't know. I don't know on the Audible side. On the Apple one, it's basically Apple owns that. But the I'm guessing that Amazon's going to continue to hold on to this. That, that would make the most sense, and it's the only way I can think of that they could make it exclusive, like they're doing. You know, well, it's just it's technically their voice you're using. So I'm just yeah. wondering if that gives them some type of ownership stake in, in your, your book, your product. Yeah, I would be making up an answer if yeah. I gave you. An it answer. probably depends <laughs> too whether they're paying for the voice or if they're using free to use voices. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I think you know for indie authors. It's a low cost entry. My question would be, can you go human after if you want to? Ooh, that's you know? a good. Yeah. That's a great question. Once actually. you've got that money and yeah. That's kind of what I was getting at yeah. though, because like based on the way the contract is set up, like you, you may not be able to, like if that becomes somehow your official audio book, um, you know, it might be an exclusive thing or that license, you know, it might be a license situation where, you know, that's a version of it that's available and you could still do the other one. Um, those, those are all questions I'd, I'd like to see answered. Yeah. I saw a lot of pushback on a couple of articles on the Facebook and some author forums today and, you know, it's here, there's no stopping it. I know there's a lot of doomsdayers with this and I could see the benefit as far as nonfiction, but I don't think it'll ever get to the point of like a voice actor actually doing your fiction. I, I don't think it'll happen. Yeah, I agree. And there's always tier to things, right? If it's not good, customers always speak with their wallet, right? If yeah, that's good, true. They won't pay for it. Or if people want the cheaper version versus the premium version, right? AI and human, like a tiered system is not a bad idea i guess yeah this this is a this is its own market is is the way we need to think of this um there's going to be the the market for you know human narrated books that's not going away just because ai can do it cheaper or faster or whatever there will be people who hate the ai narration and then there will be the people who are willing to pay a lot less and and tolerate it and the quality is not bad like some of the services google plays version of this is kind of junk and maybe it's going to get better uh apple's version of this sounds pretty good to me not you know still not in human narration level but you know it's going to improve over time too sure. so i think there's they're basically just creating a whole a whole separate market i think amazon would be crazy to prevent the authors from also having a human narrated version because they can make yeah. even more money yeah that makes amazon sense. seems to like money uh, I'd, I'd like to see some licensed versions come out too. I'm, I'm totally on board if I can get Morgan Freeman to read one of my exactly. books. Yeah. That's what I would. Like. So you remember cool. Tom Tom? You guys remember the Tom Tom app? 
the the GPS app. Oh, oh the uh, GPS. Oh, yeah, 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 for, yeah. I had that on uh, when I had like an Android phone back in the early days of smartphones, and you could pay a little extra to get like I had like the Simpsons voice pack, you know. <laughs> So that's what I was kind of hoping for with this sort of thing. So I, I want to I want to be able to license Morgan Freeman to read my books, you know. Yeah. You, well, you you can do Samuel Jackson on your your Amazon Alexa. <laughs> that's right. There's a there's a whole package for that's that. That's cool. Yep. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Simon and Schuster gets new owners. We've talked about this in the past, and this is just uh, we're kind of circling back around because this became officially official in an official way. Simon and Schuster is now under the ownership of KKR. Marking a new chapter in its near century long history, they aim to enhance its position in the is- industry, embracing innovation and continuing to take calculated risks in publishing. That's a whole lot of fluff words in one sentence, actually. That doesn't, that doesn't, none of that <laughs> means anything. Now they've got to live up. <laughs> yeah, they got, now they've got to live up they to it. They set right? the bar pretty low. We're going to innovate <laughs> and, and <laughs> take calculated risks. Ooh. <laughs> well, if you're if you're if you're an author and you're following this, get out there and just try to find the the press release that Simon and Schuster put out. Read the the whole detail behind it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm under the Simon and Schuster roof now. I'm I'm crazy impressed by the people that I've dealt with. The the forward thinking that I I hear coming out of them um, is very refreshing because I've had books with the other you know big publishers and it's it's the exact opposite. You know, like every time I step out of a meeting and you know with Penguin Random House, I feel like it's 1994 all over again. <laughs> um, and I. I don't get that vibe when I when I'm talking to the Simon and Schuster people. Um, you know, there, there's something right now that I'm working on related to TikTok, which is a completely outside of the box idea that I had. Um, and I paired TikTok up with Simon and Schuster. We ended up basically creating a, a more or less a brand new business model or track, um, and they're open to doing that now, which I think is is fantastic. So I, I think this could make them an extremely relevant player as as the years go on, and everybody's either going to be you know, doing the same thing or trying to catch up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Biden issues executive order on AI. Uh, we had a lot of fun with this one when this came through our inbox. Uh, <laughs> it requires that developers of the, of the most powerful AI systems share their safety test results and other critical information in the U.S. government. Develop, uh, they're to develop standards, tools, and tests to help ensure that AI systems are safe, secure, and trustworthy. And they're to protect Americans from AI-enabled fraud and deception by establishing standards and best practices for detecting AI-generated content and authenticating official content. Uh, Last but not least, they are to establish an an advanced cybersecurity program to develop AI tools to find and fix vulnerabilities in critical software, building on the Biden-Harris administration's ongoing AI cyber challenge. I have to tell you, though, this is also meaningless fluff to me. Like this is, they took every, I'm sorry, I'm being very cynical, but they just took every talk point and said, we have a rule against that now. And there's, but there's no enforcement of this. So, I, I think I think it's I think it's cute. The government thinks they could actually rein us in. It's kind of kind right. of sweet, you know. That they, you know, but yeah, they've they've got no. There, there's no shot in hell of them doing anything related to. Yeah. The, I mean, they can say with that they want to do whatever they want, but it's just it's not going to happen. Uh, if you get a chance, pick up. You know, I, I'm old school. I, I've been reading Wired magazine like an actual paper copy. I'm sure this stuff is all over their website. Uh, but they just did a complete issue on AI, like the whole thing covered, you know, uh, cover to cover AI. And there was a really strong article in there where they interviewed the folks behind um, OpenAI and the, basically the creation of ChatGPT and how it first started and where it is now. Um, you know, started as open source and now it's owned by all the major corporations. Um, but like the developmental process, you know, like this was basically created behind closed doors. You know, like they didn't have to open those doors and they didn't open the doors until it was almost at the point where like they didn't have a choice anymore. Like this thing was you know, just kind of grew into a little bit of a monster all on its own and all of a sudden they, they released it. You know, the, the next generation of AI, that that's exactly what's happening. It's being developed right now behind a closed door somewhere. We're going to hear about it six months after it's, you know, basically released or, or, or created. Once it starts and, looking and the for government Sarah is no different. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, like the, the, gov- the government yes. can't like <laughs> the, the government can't even get people to like update their address when they yeah. move. You know, like yeah. how, do you, how do you expect they, they they couldn't get water out to you know after Katrina? Like you know, like there's just so many like they've got good intentions, but like it's just they it moves so slow and AI is just moving so fast. You know, it's uh, God bless them. 
it's it, like I said, it's cute. Yeah, it's like when your three year old starts starts making up rules for you. You know? Yeah. That's what it feels like. Like this is a little game that Biden gets to play and he gets to stand on a stage and make some official proclamations about something some people are scared of. That's what it feels like. <laughs> I, I I just picture him taking the, the AAA batteries out of his calculator and thinking the job's done. That's his, <laughs> I have disabled That's Skynet. his idea of what AI is. I, I, Humanity yeah, wins again. <laughs> we're, we're good. <laughs> All right. You know, you oh, recommended God. reading Wired Magazine. I have to throw something in here at the end. I mean, why waste your time on Wired Magazine when you can go pick up Indie Author Magazine? Fresh on the stands oh, this month boy. with a very attractive I, I would have, cover. I would, but like I, I saw the cover <laughs> and like God, you know, like some people will do anything to sell a copy or yeah. two. Yeah, you know, I can't give this thing away. Yeah, I'm on the cover this month. So <laughs> November, yeah, and he is yeah. wearing Indie pants. Author Magazine. You, Kevin. I am wearing pants and yes, a, uh, pants. a spiffy sports coat. Yeah. I want to see you Very get like spooky. a cardboard stand up of that cover and it, it needs to be behind oh, you the next time we record. That's, yes. Okay. Like the whole wall, walls, you know, like four, four by eight. Okay. Or something. Those yeah. fat heads, those like right. sport ones Challenge that you can get. Yeah. <laughs> Little bobblehead. Yeah. Yeah. As long yeah. as you can dress it up in costumes. That's, know, that's what I should have done for Halloween seasons. this year was dress as my cover. Just have Ooh. like, you know, the sign. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'll just carry year. the magazine around with you. That's right. Hey, look at me. Right. I'm that guy. Oh, JD, who's up this week? This week we've got Sally Gardner on. She's a former costume designer for theatrical productions in London, turned illustrator and author. Uh, she's since sold more than two million copies all over the world since becoming a full time writer. Her latest title is called The Weather Woman, and it's out now. Here she is, Sally Gardner. So we are talking about your book, The Weather Woman, which is set in the 18th century between two frost fairs, and the main character, Neva, can perfectly predict the weather. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the book? Um, I'm always told that you you should be able to describe a book in a sentence to sort of give it its oomph, and I've really never been able to do that. <laughs> I, 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 I have to admit failure almost to begin with or not being able to do that. Um, but what ha I live in a, a part of England which is um, on the Suffolk coast, Sussex coast, and the skies are utterly, utterly breathtaking. And it came to me this idea as I was walking along a beach thinking, what if you could forecast the weather in a time when no one believed the skies belonged to anybody but God? And I thought that was just a fascinating idea because in the um, Regency period in England, the skies were not to be looked at. You you were not supposed to know, look up because you might see the feet of heaven. And consequently, uh, people wore their clothes. So they'd be dressed for every occasion of the weather. Huh. Um, and it was just the beginning of people beginning to say, no, 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 that isn't right. The, the weather has, uh, 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 it, it, it is an issue that we could look at and God won't reproach us for looking at it. But it was it was in that line. And then I thought, what if you were a woman, a little girl as she starts off, who absolutely can feel and hear the weather changing? What what would happen to you then in a time where women really were suspected to get married and nothing more, produce a son, and that was it, really? That was the end of your swan song. Yeah, and I don't want to spoil how Neva uh, goes about circumventing that so people can read the book to figure out how she does that. Um, I want to talk about a little bit more about uh, your writing process. So... In the acknowledgments, you say that every book is a strange journey and you had no plan for this one. Just a rough idea in your head, a beginning. You didn't stick to it. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process? Yeah, so I always start off. I don't know if you remember those start right ads. I don't know if you had them in America. But it was a little couple, a little boy, a little girl starting off with a pair of shoes. And I always think about that. I always think, yeah, you know, I always say, ah, oh, it's just nothing. You know, I, I start off in a very bad pair of flip-flops with a no mobile phone, no sweets, nothing. And I find myself halfway up a mountain 
And I think, oh, you know, I, I can do this. I can get up there. I can get back. It'll do it in a day. And sort of years later, I'm still up there freezing to death thinking, oh, no, I am no. And every time I think I've got to the peak of the book, I realize there's another mountain ahead of me. So I started this book. I was so keen to get Neva grown up. I was just dying to get her grown up. And um, my editor just went, "Mm -hmm. what have you just done? You've just, you're just doing tell. You're not showing us. So I had to go all the way back again. And I had to sort of go take a deep breath, calm down and just go with her and grow her. And um, so I I really think I am not a plotter, which I wish I was. I, I really envy people who go, I have it all on little sticky notes and I know where I'm going. I always find myself amazed by my characters. Um, And I do this one thing, which I I really would recommend for a lot of writers to do. I take my main character out to dinner. And I often do this and I take them out. I go alone and I sit down and I ask them, so what do you think of the story so far? And I think they're going to go, it's great. I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. And often they go, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you go, what? But I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, do you think I'd really do that? Well, I, obviously I did. And I find that really fascinating. And often it's the character. I think it's always the character that would just say to you, no, I, don't, no. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Do and you, you order to- uh, dinner for them? <laughs> do you know what they're going to order when you're out? <laughs> uh no, we don't get that far, but they you always drink. They Perfect. always drink. <laughs> That's the important part. So I want to um, go into that a bit more. So you said you were kind of anxious for her to grow up. Um, but you you have an interesting construction to your book. It takes place over a number of years yeah. from childhood to adulthood. And it's broken up into four parts. How did you decide on those divisions? Like what was the the significance or... How are you thinking about that in your revisions in your mind? Well, the main thing was it had to start at one frost fair, which was the frost fair that happened in England in uh, 17, oh, it's completely blank, but it's uh, it, it was 1789. And it is the time of the revolution in France. So it's a very, very big moment. And it's the moment where Europe freezes, just generally freezes it's a mini ice age. And then I wanted to end it on the other, the last really big frost fair in London, which was 1813 to 1814. And after that, we have one, maybe something in the 60s, but we don't really ever get the, the Thames freezing. So my story had to jump quite a lot of a lot of space of time. And then I got really worried about it. I kept thinking, oh, man, it, it's it's such a big space of time. But in a way, it's all based on the River Thames. And I felt it was like the volume of water itself. It demanded that breath of time and to embrace embrace it. And I, I hope I managed it and that people didn't go, oh, my, what's she doing? But yes, it was a, it was a big challenge. Yeah, and it was lovely. And I love that structure or the bookends or the loop structure, or whatever you want to call it, beginning at the Frost Fair and then ending in similar but different circumstances at the Frost Fair. So I thought that was was brilliant. And you've also said that it's helpful for you to hear how your words sound out loud. So you read to people, <laughs> to very patient people. Can you talk a bit about how that works? Well, I, I have I have to admit to being very dyslexic. So for me, Audible has always been my main passion. And I think many writers could benefit from listening to their words out loud. Uh, I worked in theatre a lot as well. And when I worked in theatre, I saw story die. I saw audience just go fall asleep, nod off. And the thing about audio is when you read it, you really know if you've got your audience sitting on the edge of a seat or whether you've got them going, oh, yeah, well, what's up? You know, you 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 can see it. So I have um, very dedicated people who listen to me. Uh, I have three of them. 
who are very patient and who go, yep, I'm on the sofa, read away. Um, and then I, with one particular scene, which was the sex scene in this book, I got three younger women to listen to it to see if they thought it was working for them. Um, so I'm very specific about, I don't, what I read. And then I have overall, I have people who look at my work and I'm, I'm very lucky. I have um, Adam Mars Jones who looks at it and I have other writers. Um, I'm very blessed in that respect, but I think reading aloud and hearing your, what I call the beat of language, the, the and have you made your words dance? I mean, you can write a line and it sounds great in the head and then you read it out loud and you think it's dead. It's not doing anything. And and I find that fascinating. I used to be an illustrator and I love line. I love the thick, thin, thick, thin. And I try my utmost to do that with my words. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, yeah, I think that's a great tip. I kind of do it with uh, my little word AI voice, which is probably not as great as hearing it in my own voice. Or, But that's amazing. And so you've said you're dyslexic. So I'd love to ask you about that, if you don't mind, if you don't want to no, talk no, about no. it. Because um, believe it or not, you're not the only dyslexic author that I know. And I just find that, I don't know, inspiring because it must be hard. Um, I'm just curious what other tips you might have for other authors who are dyslexic that might help them with their writing. Okay, so I was born with a head full of stories, but someone thought it was a joke to make it that I couldn't spell a word and that I wouldn't understand grammar, but that I would have an absolute love of language. And that some of the words would come out wrong because I, I'm severely dyslexic. And what I have discovered is I need help. I do have someone who puts it all into what I call clean script, which is my personal thing. I never want anyone to see my bad script because I call it now my shorthand. It's illegible. Um, and then I write and write and write. And, and obviously technology has really helped us dyslexic writers because we've now got Grammarly, we've got spell check, we've got um, Dragon Connect, we've got voice recognition. We are beginning to be held in a way that we have in the past was really, really hard. People like Scott Fitzgerald, who were dyslexic, really struggled with this. Uh, I, I feel, you know, in a way, thanks Steve Jobs, I am in a much better place than I would have been. I, I mean, I don't think I would have been a writer if, if technology hadn't been there. I sort of came in on the, the beginning of the wave and the wave just began to hold me. Um, I, I I think the main thing I would say to people with dyslexia uh, who want to be writers is no, no, no. It's nothing to do with spelling. I always say this to children when I talk to them. I say, everyone can sing. So all of you can sing. But then there's one voice that you just want to go, oh, my word. Oh, my word. Let me hear that voice again. Let me hear it again and again and again. And your favorite writers that you love. That is the voice you're looking for. And, and in a way, that is nothing to do with spelling. That is nothing to do with grammar. That is to do with you, just mm -hmm. you. Your voice and your story. It just goes to yeah. show you that story is everything. And then Story using, is king. Story yeah. is king. Whatever technology you need to get around the rest, right? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. That's a great tip. Um, and you did talk a little bit about uh, the historical events in your book. I'm curious about the research that you did. Tell me about finding the White uh, Club's betting books and the English Frost Fair books in the London Library. Okay. So I, I, so I got to tell you this story. Years and years ago, I was at art school and I was asked to go and get some paper from a place called Bleeding Heart Yard. It, it was in a Dickens book and the actual shop still existed in Bleeding Heart Yard. It doesn't anymore, by the way, but it did then. And I was very young and I went in and I was sent there because the man was so crotchety, no one liked going there. And I didn't know this. I went on my bicycle and I went in and the place was just like a fire hazard. You wouldn't even allow it to be allowed. And he had slats, he had paper and this very crotchety guy. And I said, oh my word, this is in Dickens' books. This is one of Dickens' books. 
And this old man in the corner of the room said, I met him. And I went, what? He said, I met Dickens and he gave me a boiled sweet. And I was about five. And I just got goosebumps. And I have always gone back to that moment thinking that is what your research has to be. It has to be a finger through the fog that touches history. And I find that in the books that I search for. So one of the main books I found for this weather woman was an almanac that uh, dealt with everything from uh, the weather from, I think I got it from 1789 to 1815. But it, it, it's always a year behind. But it, it had that quality of really feeling the fear that England had that France was going to invade them, the worry about the skies, the concern about what would happen. Um, it, it has all the reality to it. And that's what I mean about the finger touching history. And I always, always search for that. I, I don't like modern books that tell me what history is. I really need to feel something old and something real. And the betting book, um, I bought it on uh, eBay. I think I bought that one on eBay. And that was wonderful. That was Brooks, uh, no, White's betting book. And the thing about it, it was it's not quite truthful, which I also love. So it had lots of bets like... Um, would Napoleon become emperor? Or would Mary so-and-so have a boy next? Or And the bets are so small. And so just to describe the ghastliness, the Whites, I have to say, was a club, a gentleman's club in London, in Pall Mall. And it was said that if a woman walked down that street, just walked down that street, she was ruined for life, just by the mere fact she'd gone down there. So... This is a very uh, male domain. And one day a man gets knocked over by a horse and carriage and they bring the body of this poor man into the doorway. And the um, the guy the guy at the door says, well, I'll get a doctor. Two men come down. Go, no, 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 no. Don't get a doctor. I bet 500 pounds he's going to die. The other one says, no, I'm going to bet 700 pounds he's going to live. Oh. The man dies. Oh boy, yeah. But, I mean, it just it 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 was such a brilliant illustration of the sort of grossness. Yeah, and, of and the world the, back then. Absolutely, and you felt that in your book. And the bets, some of the bets are so bizarre. And your one friend there who will bet on anything to his, uh, not to his benefit. <laughs> anyway. No, and uh, that's great. So yeah, I really saw that in the book in the almanac. I remember when Neva gets it, and she's so excited. And they're like, no, no, it's only the weather in the past. And she's like, what? Well, what use is that? So, well, I love that that comes from your real life experience. Um, also, without spoiling too much, I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the techniques you used in your book. Um, there are several several standalone passages that look at the life cycle and journey of the herring. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how that parallels your main story? Um, I, I, I wanted it to cut through for everyone to go, she's just lost the plot here. She's <laughs> gone absolutely bonkers. And I, um, I, 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 I really thought just to go with that and it works in the way I wanted it to work. I, I really can't talk about it too much because I do end up giving everything away, but it, 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 um, the herring is vital to the plot of the story. And I like the idea that, you know, the story is plodding along and this fish is just still swimming and swimming and it's still got years to go and it's it's growing into maturity and it's, it's going down to where it's going to breed and it's coming back again and the story is still running and everyone's thinking, why the hell is she going on about this herring? Um, but yeah, it has well, a... Yeah, it's a lovely technique and it is a lovely parallel to your story. So I think it's, um, you know, for the writers listening, something worth looking at, how you can can do that. That looks like, well, what is this? Maybe this is not tied in. And then uh, they'll see. I'm not going to spoil it. So. <laughs> I think it's quite good for I think in this age where I think we are becoming more and more um, attention deficit. 
<laughs> in reading. And we become more and more this. I somehow think you've got to shake people from, oh, you know, maybe I, maybe I, oh, oh, what's that? I think that is a, you know, a, a vital thing to reading. I've also, I don't know whether this is interesting or not, but I've also got to this theory about chapter lengths. Um, because I, I, I personally feel anything over 3,000 words in a chapter is dead in the water. But I feel if you do small chapters, um, it's it's a psychological thing. People think, oh, look, I've read two chapters. Uh, well, maybe I'll read it. And once they've read and they feel they've got enough numbers under their belt, they're very unlikely to let it go. And it's, it's a dire book. They, they're they more encouraged to go, oh, I just read 25. Wow. You know, I, I so my page count and my chapter counts are low. Yeah, I agree with that. I do the same thing. I try to keep it, you know. Uh, probably like 1500 words is usually yeah. my target. So yeah, yeah, I totally agree. The potato chip scenes, you've eaten one, you might as well just eat one more, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's, it is exactly that. Yeah. Oh, I've, you know, I had one chocolate. Oh, I have another one. Yeah. 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 That's Why awesome. leave the rest in the packet? <laughs> exactly. Right. It's just, they're just a couple. They're small. I'll just have another one. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about theme, which is always interesting because I know some writers don't think it, about it at all. But you quote uh, John Locke, who says, uh, the necessity of pursuing happiness is the foundation of liberty. And I'm just curious if that was something you thought about early on as sort of a guiding light, or is that that's something that came out organically, or was it a later add-in? I'd love to hear about that. Okay, so I wrote a book called The Red Necklace years ago for children. And um, I ha- did a lot of studying on the French Revolution. It always riveted me that happiness is in the American Constitution. And uh, so where does it come from? And it comes from the fact that it was the right of kings to be happy. It wasn't the right of France to be happy. It was just the right of their king. Okay? Mm-hmm. So when Louis the 16th, is about to be on the guillotine. He is asked how much, how many days was he happy? How how many days? I mean, considering the whole of the nation is there to make him happy, how many happy days did he have? How many do you think he said? None. <laughs> I don't no, know. You're pretty much there. <laughs> Two hours. While Two hours. Out hunting, oh. While out hunting while the Bastille fell. Well, yeah. I just thought that is fascinating. And in a way, it's an elusive thing to put in, but it's always riveted me that it became into a constitution and it is the pursuit of happiness. It isn't the right of happiness. It's a very subtle difference. Mm-hmm. You, so you're not saying it's your right to be happy because that means nothing, but you have the right to pursue the happiness. And it's what the king was only allowed so in a way, it is the ultimate of liberty. Yeah, It is the ultimate sort of badge of we are free. Yeah, I love that. And I love, um, I can't remember if it was maybe in Save the Cat or something that they talk about the theme stated. And when you just see it, you're when you're looking for it and you see it in a story, it's like a shining moment. And you're like, yeah, that's what this whole book is about. So it was just yeah. beautiful thematic moment. Um and you have lots of beautiful metaphor in there. I mean, you use weather, obviously, as metaphor, metaphor for identity. Um, how do you think authors can effectively use metaphor in their writing? Wow. I, I don't think I can possibly comment <laughs> on how other writers can use it. I know how I use it. I because I felt whether I feel the weather of the soul, the weather of our psyche, and particularly the weather through COVID in our being. I think has been deeply affected by what has happened more than we are able to process still to this day. And I think, um, and I, I love the idea also of whether having an innate intelligence, which is something that I was began reading about. And um, I remember watching um, a policeman, I think it was seeing a tornado in America going through a town and he had watched it go through and take down one house, miss one house, and he stood. It was his house. He stood outside it, saying, 
yeah, it missed my house, but then it came back and it took it. Mm. And he said, I, I think it knew what it was doing. And I thought <laughs> it was a really interesting um, idea that you know there, there there are different winds that can winds that can drive you mad. There, this weather has, mm. and the weather is changing. We are having an effect on this, and I wanted to get that across in a way. In, in the weather woman, when we in England started burning sea coal, and there is a time, I think it goes from 1807 to 1815, when actually the snow fell white, which was magical, mm -hmm. and then the snow fell gray because of all the soot. And Neva sees the sky changing. And this came about because when I was um, in COVID, the skies in England became amazing. No planes, nobody stirring up the elements. The sky just became what it was. And I thought, wow, what we don't see anymore due to what we expect to be up there all the time. Yeah. And I, that was a beautiful moment. She's like, this is coming. And everyone's like, you're out of your mind. She's like, mm. okay. But she could see what everyone else couldn't. And that's so often the case in life, you know. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you a couple of other things, just uh, career-wise. Career-wise? That was a word. I think it sounds career -wise. good. Career-wise, it sounds good. Yeah. So there's this advice kind of floating out there that if you write for both children and adults, you should use different author names for each. So I'm curious about what made you decide to keep the same name for your adult books. Well, it's been a real battle this session. <laughs> and um publishers want me to use my 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 uh, children's name very much i came out as ray delaney to begin with because i wrote two little sexy books and i then thought i thought about charles dickens i i've i he's one of my heroes i love that guy and i thought well hell's bells you know he he did it he did it really well and the other thing that really got me was a little boy I went to a school, it was a very posh school, and uh, this little boy came up and I said, what are you reading? He was eight. He said, I'm reading Game of Thrones. <laughs> I went, oh, my word, that that is a little bit, um, you know, it's got a lot of, uh, well, stuff that isn't really for eight-year-olds. He says, it's got a lot of squishy stuff in oh, it, my. which I don't read. I skip over it and go to the story. And I thought, actually, he's... That was a really big eye opener because I remember years ago when I was quite little reading um, For Whom the Bell Tolls and thinking, oh, it's lovely. It's all about fields and people going uphill and water. It never occurred to me. It was about sex. And I then began thinking, well, actually, Sal, you know, this whole YA and these whole barriers people put up, in a way, YA was, I think, a complete red herring. I still do. Uh, I think children now can access the internet. They can get whatever they want. They're watching things they shouldn't be watching. Hell's Bells, let them read from an author who was a gatekeeper, who cares about them. Let them read. Because I don't think anyone reading The Weather Woman, even if it's not in the right age group, could ever say what I did in the sex scene was nothing but showing a power a woman can have. And that is is I think very important. I think that's magnificent. And it ha it's had me thinking about it a lot about that advice. I'm like, well, why do we have that advice? And is that right advice? And why do we do that? So I, I just think that's magnificent. And I'm delighted to hear you say that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just wish we'd get rid of these titles because I think we are, you know, I, I heard on one of your podcasts, you were saying that the literacy was going down in America. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, yeah, I'm sure it is because children... Uh, aren't being allowed to read where they wish to read. And, you know, uh, some kids are so advanced, they need to have that. But other kids aren't. But we should be, it doesn't matter anymore. I don't understand education, really. Oh, sorry, I'm getting on my, I mean, <laughs> iPads, we should be able to educate for each child's needs and encourage them where they need to go, rather than just say, Oh, you're eight. This is it. You're nine. This is it. This pancake effect is what I think what's killing reading. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And I feel like there are other countries and I can't remember where maybe Germany, uh, where they just give you where you're at, like instead of your age and grade, which I think is what a lovely yeah. concept for education, right? Advance you where you're at, advance you as much as you can individually. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we can revolutionize them. Well, revolutionize some education. We'll start a school. I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And as we're wrapping up, I just have one final question. If you could give a piece of advice to new and aspiring authors, what would it be? I think just be bold. Don't don't try and find the niche that no one's done. Just be bold. Just write what you feel from your gut and your heart and what really interests you. Don't worry about who's going to read it. You're writing for you. Just write for you and relish it. Because I tell you, the first time you write a book and it goes well, especially the last time you're really going to run in the fields of glory. Because <laughs> after that, it's like, oh my God, where am I going? What am I going? What am I doing? Yeah, just love it while you're doing it. Just love the boldness and go for it. Okay. Have you ever taken your main character out to dinner? <laughs> you know, I'm out for drinks. I don't know about out. Yeah, out, out to dinner might be a little little out there. Um, I think the, the I, I often when I teach classes, I always tell my students that they need to know their main characters as well as they know their best friend before they start writing that first page. And I I, I do firmly believe that, and I think it's along the same lines of what she was saying. Um, you know, like Sam Porter, who's my lead detective in the Four MK series. Like I know what you know, if I drop him at the mouth of Disney World, I know what ride he's going to go on first. I know what he's going to eat for lunch. Um, you know, I know about problems he had in high school. I'm like none of this stuff will ever make it into a book, but like it's in my head. Like I've shaped him to the point where he's a real person. And I think that kind of thing comes across on paper. Um, you know, what she's really telling us here is you also need to trust your characters. You know, a lot of times, especially for the plotters, you know, you write an outline, you have a story that folds out in a, in a particular way. Um, and you, if you do that, you're going to find when you sit down and start writing, the characters may have a very different idea of where that story is going to go. And at some point you've got to make a decision. Do you follow that character, that persona that's developed in your head and now become somewhat real? Um, or do you try to force that individual into following the outline that you already have. Um, and every time somebody tries to force the outline, it always seems to come out flat, at least in what I've seen. Like you, I think you do need to follow that character. If your character tells you they would turn left, then you need to make them turn left. You have to listen to them. Dan, I know Dan Kotler really well. And he's, he's much smarter than I am. So that's, it's kind of fun <laughs> to kind of tag along behind him. Uh, because he knows everything. I mean, you know, he's that guy who's like, you know, he's almost like the Cliff Clavin of, of fiction. Like he he knows a little bit of everything. And so it's kind of fun to to I have done this scenario. I did these uh, these interviews with him and with some of the other characters from that, that series that I used as as email uh, for my email newsletter. And it was really interesting to kind of do that because, you know, I'm having to kind of hop personas back and forth as I, as I talk to myself effectively, but I got surprising answers out of all that. So I, I think this exercise of, you know, doing this sort of thing with your characters, take them to dinner, take them to drinks, um, you know, sit down and, and write a uh, dialogue between you and them is a good exercise that I think would be very helpful for, for character development, but also just for, you know, for understanding your character better, but also for understanding like your relationship to that character, which is equally important. Yeah, and you don't want to stop with just the main characters. You know, make sure you hit some of the other ones yeah. too. Otherwise you end up with two really strong yeah. characters and a bunch of paper characters. That's true. Well I think there's a you know it's not unusual to have a lot of you inside your characters. So there it's already kind of built in. So that's not unusual. And like you said, you know your main character might be cooler, better looking, have more hair, etc. But uh you already kind of know that. Them. I just said smart. Yeah. They take bourbon in their eggnog. <laughs> they take bourbon. Do they take bourbon in their eggnog? That's our new if they're Irish, challenge it would be whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be whiskey at the O'Donnell house. Oh, geez. So let me ask you this. Do you ever read your work out loud, not to yourself, but to other people? 
I hate doing that. Ooh, I've, I've, <laughs> the only time I've ever done that is at a bookstore appearance, and I absolutely hated it. Um, and I only did it because, like, the bookstore owner is like, "Well, you need to read a chapter or two before you talk." And you know, Ugh. and every time I've attended one of these those kind of events, like the author always did, you know, so it, so it just kind of feels like you know the thing you're supposed to do. But like, I, I stopped that, you know, at like two or three books in, uh, you know, mainly because like from my standpoint, you know, if I were going to see somebody that I wanted to see, you know, whatever, whoever the author is, you know, like I could read the book anytime I want. I can, you know, see those words anytime I want. What I really want to do is have a conversation with them or I want to hear some stories that aren't in the book or I want, I want something different. So you're like, why waste the 15 or 20 minutes yeah. of that? Um, aside from that, like, you know, I, I've never like stood in the corner of my office and just read my book aloud or anything. I mean, if people are doing that, then that's, that's you don't do that. I, I do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, so I've done this several times at like when I've been invited to speak at like schools or libraries or something like that or an event somewhere. Um, I've done it at some awards every now and then. But the the one that's awkward to me, the, the most awkward version of this, and I now will not go on these podcasts, but the podcasts that, that want you to read a, a scene or something from your book oh, yeah. are the most awkward things in the world. I've done it a couple of times. And now I just avoid it. And it's, I get, I kind of get why you're doing it, but I, I, I wouldn't want to listen to that podcast personally, but maybe I'm just in the minority on that, but it's just such an awkward thing. Do you, do you do all the voice? Do you Man, do the I'll voices? Do, I try to do a little bit. I don't, I don't like go, I'm not <laughs> acting this thing, you know, I'm just kind of, but I change the <laughs> intonation. And if it's a female character, I might give it a little falsetto, slight falsetto, not like I'm not up there, but yeah, I, I, I'll do a little bit of that because just seems like I should, I guess. I don't know. I feel obligated. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. You feel like you're supposed yeah. to do it. And you know, as uncomfortable as it is, you try to do it. And yeah, I'm not going to do it yeah. anymore. I don't yeah, like it. The only thing that's even close to that is when I'm editing, I'll have the computer read it back to me. Because when yeah. you hear it like that, you're like, oh, yeah. Did I actually write oh. that? It's like, that's wrong. Yeah, by the way, the, so I've started doing that after fighting it for my entire career. Um, now that they have these automated things that can read it for you, I'll, I, I have it read yes. it aloud. The one that I found works the best. So Microsoft Word can do it, but on the desktop version, mm -hmm. it only has the like very Stephen Hawking sounding robot voices. Yes. But on the iPad or iOS version of, of Word, it has some fairly natural sounding natural enough that it doesn't make me want to stab my eardrums and I, I will every time i'm done with the writing and in the editing stage i play that and and it's helped me catch a lot of stuff i have to confess yep it's a good yeah. method it's very you helpful catch things with the voice that you don't catch when you're just reading on your own i did think it was interesting though that sally said um you know she related it to theater how when she was writing plays she could see where she lost the audience so i'm like that would be cool. I don't know how to translate editing into that. But I guess that, about that you could make the argument that that's a really good reason to read in front of people is that you can find where the novel's losing people. But I mean, that's true. If, if you're good yeah. at it though, right? Because otherwise you're going to lose them just because just you, you suck, suck at reading yeah. aloud. <laughs> so you need, yeah. you got to get, it, it, I, I suck at reading aloud. You, know, <laughs> you have to get more. If you're dyslexic voice like to me, read you're the, jumbling uh, all the words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I thought that it was interesting in Sally's book, she used the English uh, Frost Fair as bookends for her novel. So it starts with a Frost Fair and then it ends years later with a Frost Fair. What do you think about using like bookends or loop box, loop box, loop backs? Is that something that you would do or recommend doing? I, I heard Frost Fair and it just made me hung. It made me hungry. I, I don't know why. I just. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean it's a callback, right? So you you know you open with with this, and you could do it at the chapter level. You can do it, you know, a couple you know chapters through the book, halfway through, front and back, whatever. But like you you open with one thing, and then you you call back to it at some other yeah. some other portion, and just kind of take the whole thing full circle. I, I do that kind of thing all the time. Mm. I think I've done it, but I, I I don't have any examples. I like that. It's like kind of a nice metaphor you know i've seen lots of short stories especially but other books that they start there and they wrap it there and you see how the characters changed or something so i thought yeah. that was pretty 
I mean, to give you, to give you an example, like I'm working on a, another 4MK book right now, and I've got a character who, you know, surprise, kidnapped woman. Um, <laughs> but the first line of the, her chapter is she, she hears birds. Um, and then I go with, you know, it's just four or five words, you know, so-and-so her, hears birds. And then I have probably I don't know, two, three pages worth of stuff basically explaining where she's been and what happened and kind of getting her to this point. And then in order to bring the reader back to the fact that this girl is trapped someplace that she's not supposed to be, I, I call back the birds, you know, so-and-so hears birds. So I just repeated that same sentence again. So I was able to take, you know, all the exposition, mm -hmm. you know, which would normally just sort of be backstory and kind of dump it in there and, and bring the reader right back to it. And if you do that kind of thing properly, like it, it happens very quickly and it, you know, you jerk the reader, you know, mm -hmm. through time more or less. Yeah. And Sally also um, had this kind of like little side story, these little tiny little excerpts dropped in following this herring, which I don't want to spoil, but she said, you know, as we kind of become more and more uh, attention deficit, you've got to shake people. You got to do something to grab them. What do you think about that? I, I think that's a hundred percent true, right? Attention spans are so short these days. Yes. Like you, you almost feel like you have to grab the reader and, and shake them a little bit, you know, every couple of minutes just to make sure they're still there paying attention. How do you, uh, do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it's, it's about shock value. So I'll throw it, you know, like if I have, you know, like in the, the situation, like I just explained, you know, I've, she hears birds and then I go back through explaining, like she thought she was at a, an event, she was at a, a cocktail reception and I kind of go through the entire, you know, her arriving at this cocktail reception, the person that she met, you know, it's, it's very quick, but it's enough to bring the reader up to speed. Um, it, and it, then I bring them back to the story with, you know, she, she hears birds. So now we're back at the beginning. Now we know she's in trouble. Um, and then the very last sentence of that particular chapter is the, the man she was with, she hears his voice like off in the distance, um, basically trapped in the same room she is. And she thought she was alone the whole time. Um, so it's just, it kind of grabs the reader from, from left field. They don't see that coming. They don't expect it. Um, and you know, they're, they're going to turn that page because now all of a sudden this happened and, you know, you can't close the book right now without knowing how or why, and, you know, it causes them to go on to that next chapter. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing also I thought that Sally did is she is using the same name for her children and adult fiction. What do you think about that kind of common idea out there that you should use pen names yeah. for different genres, different ages? Do you think that's right or wrong or <laughs> you know i don't I, I i've heard a lot of arguments on both sides of this whole thing and i and they and a lot of them all of them kind of end up making some sense and it so it sort of comes down to like what is it your what's your goal there right my whole position has has been from the start that even though i have pen names i use to kind of test some things for the most part I write everything under my name, no matter what the genre is. Now I'm not switching from like the audience is still generally going to be adults. But so I'm not like switching from like YA to, Oh, I had a YA series. So maybe I do switch, but the whole point for me is I'm building a brand around Kevin Tumlinson. I want people to fall in love with Kevin Tumlinson, the writer, and then buy everything I write. Cause that's the way I always did it. You know, I, I first discovered uh, like, Orson Scott Card was one of my early influences, and I read, if that guy had his name on the corner of a phone book, I was going to read that whole phone book. And uh, and it didn't matter. He started writing some really out there stuff sometimes, like a lot of like religious fiction and things like that. And I read every bit of it because I was there for that guy's voice. So that's what I'm looking for. I want readers who are looking for me, not necessarily Dan Kotler or any of the other uh, series or characters or formats I write well, in. It, it's all about brand, right? You know, that, that's basically what you described. You're, you're creating a brand. So why create three or four different brands? You know, unless you have to, like she had mentioned, she wrote two erotica novels, you know, it's very different from the other stuff she wrote. Like in yeah. a case like that, it makes sense. Um, you know, it, when it comes to, you know, young adult and, and that sort of thing, I mean, look at somebody like Bob Stein, R.L. Stein, you know, he wrote it in the kids at, you know, really young age with goosebumps. And then he created Fear Street. 
And if he wanted to, he could easily create adult novels. Um, you know, if he used a different pen name for each of those groups, now all of a sudden he's got to create three separate audiences instead of, you know, a scenario where his audience is growing up with them. You know, he's got them at the young age. He's got them at the teenagers. He's got them at, you know, as, as adults. Um, you know, why not take them along for the ride? Like, I, I know for me personally, like my average readership is women 45 and over. Like, that's a stat my publishers love to throw out there at me. Um, it's one of the reasons why I wrote She Has a Broken Thing Where Her Heart Should Be. And I wrote it as a very, you know, in a young adult novel type fashion because I wanted to rope in a younger audience and it did work. You know, my older audience liked it, you know, so they were on board with it and it allowed me to go out there and get a much larger group from the young adult category that may not have even known who I was without something like that. Um, I, I teased, I, I told him it's almost like being a literary Pied Piper, you know, like look, look for that hole and try to try to fill it. Uh, but in today's world, it just, it doesn't make sense to have multiple pen names. You know, if, if your genres are close yeah. enough where you can get away with using just one. Um, I mean, imagine multiple Facebook yeah. pages, all your social media, multiple Ugh. websites, like all of it. That's a complete nightmare. You don't want any part of that. Have any of you watched the Judy Bloom documentary? I think it's on Amazon Prime. No, I haven't. I don't know exactly no. where it is, but you should watch that. It's interesting because, and, and, and I bring that up because that's effectively what she did was she started off writing children's books, and then over time, she kind of aged her her writing persona itself, like, you know, started writing for older and older audiences, sometimes to her detriment, like people would complain, there'd be backlash, because she talks about sex a lot, you know, she talks about, you know, masturbation and things like that, uh, and, and a lot of people find that inappropriate for children, and they don't want their kids reading those books, but the documentary is really worth worth watching. Uh you get to see a, an interesting career unfold from beginning to end. She's, she's very publicized. <laughs> cool. All right. And as we wrap up, J.D., who's up next week? Next week, we've got New York Times bestseller Beth and Boyd Morrison. They're here to tell us about their latest novel, The, Tr the Last True Templar, uh, which is out now. I, I, I eat up anything related to Templars, Knights Templars, so that should be fun. Yeah, sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.